Okay, hello everyone. This is the third time. Hopefully this will be the charm. My name is Eric Rutens from Matrix Games, and I'm here to show you Gary Grigsby's War in the East. And I see that we have a window that is too small. Let me see if I can resize that. And hopefully that'll be the last technical issue we have today. Yeah, that's looking pretty good now. So everyone, let me know in chat if that looks good to you. And I will start the intro over. All right. So again, uh, my name is Eric Rudens. I'm here to show you Gary Grigsby's War in the East. Uh, this is releasing today on Steam, uh, along with its two expansions, Dawn to the Danube and Lost Battles, which include a lot more scenarios, um, some expanded content for the original game. Uh, the original game came out in 2010, but it remains the absolute best computer war game of the Eastern Front in World War II ever made. And for those of you who may be interested in the Eastern Front, I'm going to hope to show you today how it plays and why this may be the game for you. Um, the game has been continually updated over the last five years, so we've had many, many major updates, major improvements in gameplay, realism, accuracy, adding significant game subsystems, so this is not the same game. Uh, except superficially as the one that released in uh, 2010. Though as with many war games, a lot of the changes in terms of the improvements in gameplay and history, historicity are only appreciated really once you get into the game, because a lot of them involve subsystems and are under the hood. Now for today, I'm going to show you what's one of the introductory scenarios. Uh, if we take a look here at the scenario list, these are all the scenarios that come with the base game as well as the two expansions. What we're going to do today is called Road to Minsk. And this is a scenario that I would recommend a lot of you take a look at if you're new to War in the East when you first load it up. It only lasts for three turns. It only covers a portion of the Eastern Front at the very beginning of Operation Barbarossa um, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union. And uh, it's really a great way to just learn how the game works. So let's go ahead and load this. I've got my default game options set already. There are a lot that you can control as far as the... Uh, um, how you want the AI to play, how challenging you want it to be, uh, what the delays you want in the interface are, and so on and so forth. Now here we are at the main map. What you can see here in the bottom left is the actual miniature version of the entire game map if we were playing the full campaign. As you can see it's pretty vast. It stretches from Germany in the west all the way to the Ural Mountains in the east and it goes south to the Caucasus and north up to Finland and Sweden. So what we're looking at here is the small slice. And you can see the darkened hexes around the edge they are showing us our play area. And what we have here is we have the two sides facing off along the original border at the beginning of the Operation Bar Barbarossa invasion. And I'm going to play through uh, this scenario for you, or at least I'm going to see how far I can get in the time that we have. And give you an idea of how you plan, uh, what's in the game, and so on. So first thing I'm going to do is turn on a couple of the overlays here. This one shows us the uh, difference between friendly and enemy territory. This one shows us our fortification levels on the map. This one shows us uh, the modes that our units are in, and also whether our units are isolated or receiving limited supply. So with these on now, I'm now going to start taking a look at the units themselves. Now, you can see we've got the traditional wargame counters here, and they have on them two values. The first one is an approximate strength of the unit, and the next one is the remaining movement of the unit. But there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, if you take a look further into each of these units, you'll see that what the game actually models is the exact table of order and equipment of each of those units. So it's got, uh, let's take a look here for example, it's got the SDK of Z 221 armored car and 16 of those are ready, none are damaged and their experience is averaging 85 out of 100. Uh, if we look at these it actually gives you the picture of it, it gives you the detailed statistics and these are all used in the game. When this particular 12th Panzer Division fights the 221 armored cars here are going to play a part in that based on their statistics and their experience. As well as that, there's logistics modeling. So what we can see here is our supply, fuel, ammunition, and support. 
All of these are rated for each of these units, and there's a fairly complex system that every turn goes through the supply chain and replenishes these units, as well as tracking how much they use as they move. In addition to the main unit, you can have subunits, what we call support units. Each main unit can have up to three of these. These can be automatically assigned by the headquarters. These can also be manually assigned by the player. So let's take a look at some of these down here, for example. This is a fairly famous group here, the second Panzer group. This was under General Guderian, uh, who was pretty famous for his uh, previous exploits with the Blitzkrieg Doctrine and his advocacy of it uh, during the time before World War II. So this is the headquarters of the second Panzer Group. As we select this, we see highlighted in blue uh, the subunits of that headquarters. So this is the group headquarters, and then we've got these different core headquarters. And as each of these are selected, you can see that other units at the same level, in other words, the other core headquarters and the airbase, are highlighted in yellow. The higher HQ is highlighted in orange. And again, the subordinate units are highlighted in blue. So as we take a look at these subordinate units, you can see here we've got a stack, and over here it shows you on the right what's in that stack. And for each of these, we can again drill down and take a look at what's in there. Now, you don't have to play to the exact, uh, you know, T, O, and E of each unit that you're playing. You can use these higher level numbers, the 18-50, just to get an idea of what that unit can do, and you can get a pretty good feel for this. Once you're an experienced player, you get a pretty good idea of uh, what the differences between the units are and what you can expect the unit to accomplish. But in this case, let's say we want to give this unit as another support unit to assign it. We would just go in here and we can preview what is the TO and E of the support unit. In this case, these are flamethrower tanks, or in this case, these are pioneers or combat engineers. And we can assign that unit to the headquarters, or to this particular unit from the headquarters or we can leave it up to the headquarters. If we look at this headquarters, we can see the general who's assigned to it. The general is also rated for his abilities in politics, morale, initiative, administration, mechanized and infantry combat, air and naval. And it also tracks all these support units attached to the HQ. If you leave it up to that, which is fine, then the general will assign these support units out to his fighting units as those battles happen. Now what else can we take a look at? So each scenario obviously has victory conditions. And in this case, what we're looking at is the victory point screen. And we can see that as the axis here, we want to take Minsk. That's our end game, e.g. victory points are 500 for taking Minsk. We'd also like to take Vitebsk, Mogilev, and Zhlobin for 200, 200, and 100. And we also gain points for Soviet Union losses, men, guns, armored fighting vehicles, and aircraft. The Soviets, meanwhile, earn points every turn that they keep Vitebsk, Mogilev, and Zhlobin, and they earn big points for keeping Minsk and some of these others at the end of the game, and they obviously want to cause us a lot of losses. So right now there's no great advantage. So if we look at the map here, Minsk is right here. Mogilev is over here. Vitebsk is over here. And... Let's take a look. Brest-Litovsk and one of these is Zhlobin. I'm trying to remember which one it is. There it is. So this is Zhlobin over here. So basically our other three objectives are all three map edge towns. So basically if we can drive all the way to the edge of the map in three turns then we'll get those. So let's start off with our air campaign. We want to start out by bombing the Soviet airfields. We've got them surprised, and we want to catch as many of their airfields, air, air units, uh, aircraft on the ground as we can. So we'll switch over to here. This shows us where the Soviet airfields are. You'll see each of these symbols here with this looks sort of like a Mobius strip or an infinity symbol. That's the NATO counter for air units. And in this case, we're just going to go ahead and automate this. You don't have to do all this manually. So we'll tell the AI to go ahead and bomb some of these airfields. Now what we can see here is that we've got um, each of these airfields being bombed by our air forces. It's showing us the lines of where the attack is coming from, where the bombing is happening, and then it's showing us a report on the top. Now these reports are going by fairly fast. You can pause them anytime you want and stop to look at them. Like we pause this one and you can see what planes are involved on each side and what the losses caused were. 
and as soon as these finish, I will also show you a way to review the battles afterwards. So these battles are done, and if you take a look here at the top, there's also this button that says Show Battle Sites. If we click on that, then everywhere where there's been combat this turn, one of these symbols appears, and you can just click on it like this, and it'll show you again. Here are the forces participating on our side from Luftflotte 2. Here are where the Soviet forces defending, 30 MiG-3s and 5 Yak-1s. And we had two of our bombers were lost. We destroyed 131 fighters and 45 bombers in bombing the airfield. We can also look into more details if we wish. And we can look at the second battle here. There was a second attack where we destroyed quite a few more planes on the Soviet side. We can also look at the losses screen. And if we look here, we can see in terms of ground losses, the Soviets lost some manned aircraft, some support squads, some vehicles. But if we look at air losses, what we can see here is we've actually at this point, for the cost of four Axis aircraft, we destroyed 802 Soviet aircraft, of which 785 were lost on the ground. So that gives us the initial German surprise attack on the Soviet airfields. Now we're going to proceed with the ground war. And what I can show you interface-wise, by the way, is there are sort of three different tabs up on top. These bottom buttons here are basically your different modes. So if you're moving a unit normally, you use this. If you want to move it by rail, you use this. This is for naval transport. This is for amphibious transport. Then you have air modes. So if you want to fly reconnaissance missions, bomb units, bomb airfields, bomb cities, air transport, air transfer, they're mainly used for resupply, things like that, or moving air units around. And then you have the show battle sites and your end turn. And then up on top, again, we have our different map related buttons that give us our map information. You can zoom the map in, you can zoom the map out. We can turn on and off some of those overlays that I was looking at before and turn on information about factories. We can break down our units so a division can break down into regiments if we needed to, so on. Then we have our information screens, such as here we have our order of battle, which shows us our, well here we have the Army Group North and Army Group Center. Most of our forces are under Army Group Center in this case. And you can dive into any of these. So for instance, again, here's the second Panzer Group. And in this case, it shows you everybody who's under the second Panzer Group. And we can click through to any of those. Uh, then we've got the losses screen that I took a quick look at. And this, you can track ground losses, air losses, or destroyed units. You've got the production screen. Uh, not, as cr not really important for a small scenario like this, but if you are playing with one of the large campaign scenarios, uh, then you really kind of want to keep track of what you're getting in terms of your production capacity and your replacements. Everything that's a piece of equipment in one of your units, whether it's a squad or a tank, is going to have a certain amount of them built as replacements each turn and then distributed around to the units that need them. And keeping track of that and keeping track of sort of whether you're running ahead of your replacements or depleting your replacement pool or whether your replacements are building up is an important thing to know. We've also got weather, uh, air doctrines, reinforcements and withdrawals. Um, I don't think, okay, we're withdrawing one siege mortar battery here. And then we've got the commander's report screen. And this is the last thing I'll show before we actually start moving units around. So the commander's report screen actually is a really handy tool because it's got a ton of filters and it's completely sortable. So if you're looking at your units right now, which is the initial tab I've selected here to look at the units, I'm going to start by saying, let's show no units. And then I'm going to say, well, I only want to see my infantry units. Okay. And now what it gives me is a list only of my infantry units. And it shows me what the name of each one is, where it is, what it's attached to. And you can click on these and go to the actual map as well. And you can set things like what you want them to be set to in terms of their um, uh, replacement levels and so forth. It's, it's a useful tool. We can also look at armored units and we can see these are all of our armor units. We have two of these flame throwing tank battalions and the rest of these are panzer divisions and where they are. You know, we can do the same thing with um, headquarters. Like we can look at uh, armies. These are the armies we have under our command air units, so on. We can also look at the HQ screen, which automatically gives you the HQ's air group screen. You can look at your leaders. We could sort them, for example, so we don't know who our best 
mechanized leader is? Well, there it's Heinz Guderian. And we've got uh, uh, von Schreppenberg, Hermann Hoth, Hermann Balk also up there at the high, level, high ratings. And here again, you can look at all the battles you've fought and see the results. Look at the different locations and look at your equipment, sort of an equipment encyclopedia. So if we want to take a look, say, at the Panzer 3H, we can see here exactly what it is, and we can even compare it, for example, to a Panzer 3G if we want to see how they stack up with each other. So these are very useful functions in terms of information management. But let's talk about playing the game itself now, because it's actually not very hard. If you can left-click to select units, and you can right-click to move an attack, then you can play the game. So I'm going to show you how that works now, and I'm going to describe our plan. Two things. We have a whole mass of Soviet forces here northwest of Brest-Litovsk. Let me turn off the units for just a sec. So you see Brest-Litovsk is down here, and we have a whole mass of Soviet units up here. And our number one objective is Minsk. So I'm going to try to drive with the second Panzer group up through here to Minsk. I'm going to try to drive here with the third Panzer group through Vilnius down to Minsk. And then I'm going to also try to make secondary drives to close off this group of units. So we're aiming to sort of make a bigger pocket as well as a smaller pocket. I'm not necessarily saying this is the best strategy, but this is a strategy that has worked for me. So we're going to start off by clearing out some of these chaff units. I'm actually going to move up some of these guys here. And I'm just right-clicking to move. So those have both moved up there. And I'm now going to left click here to deselect one of them. So I'm just attacking with one division and going to try a hasty attack. Now by default you do a hasty attack which uses more or less half of your combat strength. And that's a right click. If you uh, hold down the shift you get what's called a deliberate attack which is a more planned attack with more chance of support units participating, a larger portion of your own units participating. It's a much more effective attack but it takes up more time and more of your movement. In this initial turn of the scenario, we have some pretty big advantages because of the surprise that make it cost us much less to do either type of attack, but we're going to try to do hasty attacks as much as we can just to stretch out our movement and make our breakthrough go that much faster. So here's our first attempt. And we force this rifle division to retreat. So I'm going to take that same unit, move another hex here, and I'm going to attack this group with the 16th Rifle Corps HQ and the 10th anti-attack artillery brigade. And again, looking at this here, we force them to retreat. We've got a very favorable loss exchange at this point, at this point as we would expect. And I'm going to push these guys down here, and I'm going to do a hasty attack here. Now what I'm trying to do is clear away some of the frontline troops, because I want to make it possible for my panzers, my faster troops, to exploit. We've got one last division here, which we will move up to here. And we will do a deliberate attack in this case because of the strength of the enemy units. And you can see, actually, they held on. So let me discuss this screen a little bit to explain to you what happened. Um, whenever a combat happens, it not only looks at the equipment in the unit and other soft factors like its supply, its fuel, its morale, its fatigue of its different elements. It also looks at the commanders, and every commander up and down the chain of command has to do a series of checks against their ratings. And all of these things combine to what's called the CV, the combat value. And you'll see that down here. And we can see that our CV started out at 89 and ended up at 49.3. Now the CV, the way to think about that is that's sort of your pushing power. That's, in other words, the amount of force you're exerting that's either going to force the enemy to retreat or break or what have you. You can step separate from the lethality of your individual pieces of equipment. In other words, they may be shooting, they may be damaging the enemy, and as they're damaging them, they're also reducing the contribution those damaged or destroyed elements would make to the enemy's CV, but that's not the only factor. So things like uh, your fortifications, the terrain you're in, and all those leadership checks and things like the supply and ammunition and, and so on, those checks and levels, all those can influence CV. So the end result is, in this case, we started out at 89, we obviously failed some of those checks, went down to a 49, they started at 33, ended up at a 45.3. So we didn't manage to reduce their fortifications, and they actually held on. 
So we're going to go and hit them again. And now we actually force them to surrender for the fortified region, and we, which is basically the uh, extra fortifications there and the men manning them, and we force the rifle division to retreat. So you can see they lost about 1,600 men, 65 guns of various kinds, two armored fighting vehicles. We lost 189 men and four artillery there. And we actually got a good amount of air support in this case as well. And you can also see the CVs. We went from a 76 to a 200 in this case. They went down to a 16. So we had some very good uh, checks in that particular combat. So we cleared those away. I'm now going to push on with some of the units from this core, the second core. And note also the color coding. So you'll notice these German units all have a gray background on their counter, but the center indicates the general formation they're with, the army. So these guys who are green, they're from the same army that these guys are down here. They were just a core that was split off. These guys who are sort of a, a magenta or pink, they're from a separate army. In this case, this is the 16th army, whereas these guys down here are from the 9th army. And again, in each of these cases, the leaders are different, uh, and so that affects the chain of command, what support units can be allocated, and so on. So we're going to move these guys up to here. And again, because we've got... Now, what you'll see notice on defensive units is it's not the Soviets' turn, so it's going to show their... Instead of showing their movement, what it shows is their sort of their attack power and their defense power. So it's a 3 with an equal sign and a 7. And I've got an attack power of 8. If I hasty attack, I can figure that's probably going to be more like a 5. So I'm going to go ahead and deliberate attack this tank division to get it out of the way. And that succeeded quite well. I'm going to follow up across this river and hasty attack to try to drive them. Uh, they held for that hasty attack. We'll try another one. And that routed them. And what you'll see as they route is also they basically are moved and they're in a very bad state now. They're moved to a point where they would in time reorganize unless you overrun them again where they are in that case. We're going to try and attack across the river here. And we managed to clear the Soviet forces out of Kaunas. And we will move a division over here to try to get a few of those Soviet forces out of the way too. Alright, so we've cracked that front part of the line there. And I'm also moving some headquarters just to again keep them near the formations that they are actually using. You'll notice that as I move this headquarters here, the units that were supporting units went from being highlighted in red to being highlighted in blue. That was an indicator of whether they were, in fact, in command or not. Uh, now what we're going to try to do is move some of the infantry divisions along with the 3rd Panzer Group to further exploit this breach before I go storming through to Vilnius. So we're going to have a deliberate attack here, clear the Soviets out of the last of those fortifications, and then we'll try to roll up the line as we go. And what you saw in that case is we didn't push them out, but we did reduce their fortification level. So we know the next attack on that particular position is going to go better. I don't know if you guys are able to actually hear the sound from the game or not. There actually is music and sound effects in the game, but after the technical difficulties we had at the beginning, I'm not sure that they are actually coming through in this case, so let me know if they are or are not. I'm not sure if I can fix that, but I'll try if they are not. Alright, so let's start storming on through. So I'm going to start with this 14th motorized division in the back. Uh, we can see here again, very high experience, good morale. These guys have plenty of fuel, supplies, and ammunition. They're not fatigued. That's the FAT column here. So let's start pushing on through. And as we go, they're going to be converting hexes to our control. 
And to respond to that question um, from a, a grip of Maxentius, um, let me just once again point out this battle display. So anything anywhere where you have a fight, you pull this up and you can review exactly what happened in that battle, including going through the details if you if you want. And you also have on your info screens uh, a summary of your losses right now. So we can see right here, for example, the Soviets have lost so far. 15, or if we combine types, 16 T26s, 17 T34s, 11 T28s, and 36 T38s, along with a whole lot of stuff for 457 rifle squads, for example. Um, meanwhile, on our side, we've lost about 75 rifle squads so far. These are damaged or destroyed. They're basically in the casualty pool. Um, in some cases, they're fully destroyed. In other cases, they just need some replacements to be put back in action. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to keep moving along, clearing a path with this. Uh, and so we captured some fuel there. What you'll notice is anytime you come up to what's considered a sort of a non-combat unit, like a non-frontline unit, in this case it was an HQ unit, you have a chance of capturing supplies. They basically immediately relocate. You can't, you don't attack an HQ. Instead, what you're doing is you're forcing them to relocate. That can result in them losing supply. Um, weakening them in other ways. It can cause a leader casualty, per se, so you've overrun part of their position, but you're never actually uh, wiping out the entire HQ unless you have them surrounded, isolated, and there's just no way out for them to route to. So you can see here now, we've gone right through Vilnius, and look at how close we are to Minsk. But now we've got a Soviet rifle division, the 24th rifle division, the way in these light woods. And where we are right now, uh, we've got an attack strength of 9 at this point. What you'll notice is our fatigue is up to 44 for this unit. Uh, we've got some, even though we haven't fought anybody, we've got some damaged elements simply because of the movement we've been doing. And we've also been using up supplies and fuel and ammo. So we've still got plenty because we were stocked up at the beginning, but all those also factor into what it's showing us as the current strength of the unit. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to pull up another motorized division and bring it along with this one. And so what we'll do is we'll stack these both up and we'll use both of them together with a combined strength now of 18 to do a hasty attack and see if that's enough with two of them together to push this unit, this 24th Rifle Division, out of the way without having to do a ha uh, deliberate attack and use up more of our movement. And we did manage to do it. And now I will push again with just one unit at a time. Let's see if they can keep pushing them. And okay, so here's an important point. Well, you may have seen two interesting things just happened here. We saw a brief message that the 64th Rifle Division was committed from reserves. So, Ander on the Soviet side passed a check and was able to take a unit that was nearby and able to fight and commit it to this battle, even though it wasn't originally in that hex. You see that represented here as the 64th Rifle Division with this R. And we can see that the 24th committed gave us gave it 24 of its CV, and the 64th added 18 more, which put it up to 42 compared to our 43. Now we got a good check and went up to 92, but they were 51. And our commander at the same time passed the check, realized the Soviet forces were stronger than expected, and he changed from a full-on attack into a more scouting attack, which limits our losses. So what we're going to do is we're going to now switch this guy, these, these guys over to, again, using the double attack from both motorized divisions and seeing how that goes. And so in this second instance, reserve forces were not able to be committed, and we're able to push on. I will try that one more time with the combined motorized division. So we routed the tank division and we caused the rifle division to retreat. And now only one of these motorized divisions still has enough movement to keep going. So what I will do is I will send that one over here. Now we also have to think about our lines of supply and communication. So while I'm driving ahead here, I'm not planning to leave this entire area vacant. The Soviet forces could easily drive back through and uh, close that penetration that I've made in their lines, but I'm not going to use these forces that I'm using as my spearhead just yet. I'm going to switch over to now is I'm going to switch over to using the 7th Panzer Division, which at this point is a strength 24. And so we're going to send that down this way. 
and use that as our new spearhead. And we're going to see if again with just a hasty attack if it can push through the, this, these two rifle divisions, one of which is the 24th that we damaged before, that are blocking our path to Minsk. No problem. We push through them rather decisively. And that means we're now able to advance. We captured some supply and fuel by making that airbase relocate. And now looking at this, I don't have the movement to do a deliberate attack. I don't think I'm going to be able to take Minsk this turn. Um, but I might consider if I can bring another Panzer Division down, maybe doing a double hasty attack on Minsk. Let's actually try that. So we're adding the 20th Panzer Division in here, so they're, they, one has five movement now, one has four, and with both of them together we're going to see. We're going to need some good rolls for this, but we're going to attack into the urban terrain here and see what we can do. Oh, they got a reserve, they got two reserve commitments, including an airborne brigade and an additional rifle division, so I'm thinking this is not going to go well for us. It did not. So we will just redirect our units, and we'll push to the west of Minsk to try to cut off that side and taking this other panzer division here all right so they're stuck for now they've used up enough movement that they're not really going anywhere else at this time so what we're going to do on this side here is we're going to start solidifying our flanks before we commit the last of our mechanized units up north What I may actually do here is break this unit down. So I'll take and separate it into regiments. Oops, that was my mistake. I forgot to deselect one of those. But so now it's covering these two hexes instead of just one. And I split it up into regiments. And we'll move the headquarters up into here again. Obviously, this headquarters is now pretty far away, so we'll move it up. And we're going to place it in the same hex with this motorized division so that it's got protection so the Soviets won't be able to easily displace it. And now we've got the last part of the uh, 3rd Panzer Group, which is the 57th Panzer Corps under Adolf Kunzen. And we're going to start with the 18th Motorized Division and use that as an additional part of our flank protection. So I'm going to break that down again. Select one of these guys and we'll move them to this hilly area here. And we'll move this one over here. And then we'll take the 19th Panzer Division. And what we'll start to do move it over this way to try to cut the lines. Yep, see, so now we've cut the rail line going out of Minsk on that side. So we're hoping to prevent the Soviets from withdrawing the units in Minsk, since we were not able to immediately take Minsk. And over here... Cool. So, move some of these guys down to the... Uh, just west of Minsk to help close the outside part of that pocket. This is going to be a tough attack on this one, but we'll see how it goes. Yep, didn't quite manage to pull it off. Let's attack them again. Sometimes the Soviets are weaker at the start in terms of their supplies and ammunition, so if you put a few attacks in, you're able to budge them. We weren't in this case. But we now got a strong force to the west of Minsk, to the northeast of Minsk, and to the north of Minsk. And that will then move our headquarters. Now 
I want to show you one more thing that we're going to do. So we've got these Panzer Divisions over here. So we sent this one pretty far and it's now got 241 fuel out of 320 that it needs. So what we're going to try to do is fly in some fuel over to that division so that for next turn hopefully it's able to move a little bit more. We don't have much. We have one unit that can reach. It's going to be a fuel drop of 64 tons, so we're going to go ahead and launch launch these guys to resupply that unit. So we got 59 tons of fuel to that unit, and we could try the same thing over here. and we've used up our supply planes that can reach that far. So now you may recall we also wanted to drive from the south with Guderian's second panzer group. And so what we've got here is we've also got the fortress of Brest Litovsk to deal with, which was historically a bit of an issue. We're going to try to make it less of an issue for us. So I'm going to start once again by using my infantry divisions to clear the path a bit here. Clear out some of these Soviet border guard units. And here we're going to do a combined attack from two different hexes onto this uh, rifle division. Didn't quite bump them out. It was a bad roll for us. Got them that time. gentlemen back here, and let's clear out from the north side as well. Alright, and so we can move this infantry division in here, push those last that last border regiment out of the way. Now what I will try to do here is using some of these infantry divisions. Let's see if we can take Brest Litovsk in a large combined assault from front to back. And we did actually manage to push them out. We got some good rolls there. So we're gonna move in and follow up. Alright, great. So that's cleared the way. I may have used more force than some might on that first turn, but I'd like to get that completely cleared out for Bavarian. And we'll move these infantry divisions up a little further, again just to see how much space we can make. Alright, so now we've got our various mechanized and motorized units, so we'll start, let's see, let's start back here with the 10th Panzer Division, and let's move that one up, and try to clear the path again. Um, and what difficulty settings do I have here? Uh, I'm playing against the AI on Challenging, which is what I recommend for anyone who has played uh, any you know, reasonably uh, detailed war games before. Uh, the AI on challenging does a pretty good job. Uh, once you become very experienced with this, you might want to crank it up another level beyond that. And as far as the exact formulas, uh, there are a lot of things that go into that. A lot of this is explained in the manual, but in short, when it decides on CV, it looks at first every single element in the unit. So for example, each of these contributes CV. You know, and a Panzer 3G versus a Howitzer versus a Rifle Squad or a Panzer Grenadier Squad will contribute different levels of CV to the total CV. But then in addition to that, other factors are considered, such as what's the unit's supply or fuel or ammo state, what is its fatigue, what is its morale. Uh, morale is actually a big driver of CV, 
and units can gain or lose morale over time depending on how you're doing, uh, how your overall force is doing, and whether those units have been seeing victory after victory or whether they've been seeing losses and getting beaten up by enemy units. Um, so, you know, as units TONEs drop, as they get tired, as they lose supplies, as they get demoralized, all that factors into CV. But then in addition to that, you've got your chain of command. So, um, again, to briefly summarize, each of these generals is rated for various ratings, and some of those will factor into CV checks all the way going up the chain. So your biggest impact on your CV is going to come from your core commander because your core commander not only has the most influential check on your CV, but it will take, uh, but he is the one who can also commit support units from those available to the core to any given combat. So for example, this core has the Mountain Pioneer Battalion. Some cores have a lot more support units available, like this one here. Uh, everything from Howitzer and Naval Warhead Battalions to Flak and Stug Battalions that they can uh, commit to any given battle uh, if the leader passes the right checks. But also, if the you know there there are secondary checks. So, for example, if your core commander fails a check, the army commander has a fallback check where he can try to effectively pick up the slack. And if he fails the check, the army group commander might. And that goes all the way up to the very top of the chain. It just becomes less and less likely, you know, after the core commander level. So, you know, most of the time, if the core commander fails, it's going to have a pretty big influence on the battle's CV. And yes, good point from the chat here. So the casualties you're taking during the combat, not just what you start the combat with, also influence CV. So while your your actual results in terms of the losses your units cause, you know, are not caused by CV, they're caused by each individual weapon system actually firing during the battle and fighting out the battle, they do influence the final CV at the end. So what you go into the battle with, if you're taking a lot of losses, is not necessarily going to be what you end up with. We're going to go ahead now and again push through here. So we push that tank division out of position and we'll see how far the 10th Panzer can go in this southern arm of the uh, Pinesir for the involvement that we're trying to create here. And you'll notice again those units that are non-combat or routed units they don't try to fight, they just displace, and displacement can cause them further uh, disruption. But um, they'll just they'll just try to get out of the way. They're not going to stand up and put up a fight for you. All right, so let's take uh, the Das Reich division here and send them a little further up. Here we have another reserve commitment on the Soviet side, but we fought through it. Fantastic. So we're able to clear Baranovici here, and uh, we're going to move just a little to the south of that. And then we've got the. Actually, at this point, it's not that far through the rest of them. Well, let's move um, the 10th Motorized Division up and push on a little further. And when we're done with these two big pincers, then we're going to try and create this little additional uh, enclosure here just to make sure that these units here don't get out. Because we don't want them joining up. We may lose a few from that uh, larger envelopment uh, just short of Minsk, but hopefully we won't lose any from the uh, area with the west of that around uh, north of Brest-Litovsk here. You can see as I'm hovering my mouse around here, it's showing me with these blue uh, indicators, compass indicators, how many movement points I'm going to have left. And it's showing me the movement path it will take to any given location. And all I have to do after I've left click to select the unit is then right click and it will proceed to move where I've just asked it to move.
Alright, so we've got a very strong force there now, and I think it's time to unleash our main spearhead here. So let's start with the 17th Panzer Division, and here's another example to look at, by the way. Notice how the 18th Panzer Division has a CV of 15, and the 17th Panzer Division has a CV of 19. You notice they look pretty similar in other respects. 238 tanks, 225 tanks, 139 guns, 140 guns, nearly 16,000 men, a little over 16,000 men. This one has, you know, really a quarter more CV than the 18th, and why is that? Well, if we look at the 18th, their morale is 75. I mean, they were um, uh, relatively more recent, less experienced division. The 17th here is a morale of 85. So that accounts for the rest of the difference. There are also some uh, equipment type differences, but one of the biggest differences you'll see that influenced the CV right there was the 10 point morale difference between those two units. So let's take the 17th and drive them up to here. Actually, let's see. We'll go this way and try to push those guys back a little bit to the east. Take the 18th and we'll push them up to here and start closing that Kleinzer. I'm expecting the last two divisions here around Brest Litovsk to be able to connect up all the way. They have the movement and the starting position to be able to do that. So let's take those now. Not quite. Oh, the weather in this one is a big deal. Once you get to, you know, the mud and uh, in the Grand Campaign, once you get through to the mud and to the winter, uh, you're really in trouble as the Germans, especially through that first winter, but it's just so much harder to attack and make progress during the mud. And so you can play with either the historical weather, um, where it will follow what the actual weather was for each turn, and here I simply fell short. I'm a little rusty here apparently in closing this loop because I was not able to actually close those last two hexes. So blame that one on me. I know there are people that can do this in their sleep. I used to be able to, but apparently for today I wasn't quite able to get there. But so, blame me for that. Um, the weather though is really going to slow you down, and there are scenarios that start at all kinds of points in time uh, during the Eastern Front, so you don't have to start at the beginning. You can start part way through, you can start with Case Blue, you can start with Stalingrad, you can do individual smaller battles, um, you can do, I mean, they're more like operations than battles, you know, so things like the Battle of Kharkov or, um, or so forth. There are, and the battles go all the way to the later war, you know, things like Operation Conrad, um, fighting in Hungary and, and Bud around Budapest and such. Um, so there's a pretty darn good slice of the Eastern Front, and of course the Grand Campaign and various variants of the Grand Campaign and their victory conditions are really the you know the bulk of that, but all these others are the icing on that cake. So now I've got to worry about my headquarters here a bit to make sure that all these units that I pushed up that they're actually gonna be able to be in range of their headquarters next turn. First time I've tried to play this and talk at the same time, and I think it's actually using some parts of the same part of my brain <laughs> because I can't believe the gap I just left here. Uh, it will be pretty easy for them to run through, but oh well. Uh, so let me also show you something else. What this is, this FBD unit, this is a rail repair unit. What you guys may or may not be aware of is that as the Germans advanced into the Soviet Union, they actually had to do a lot of conversion on the rail lines uh, because there was a difference in the gauge so their trains wouldn't work 
you couldn't just run on the Soviet rail lines, you know, unconverted. So they had some of these. Um, there are various units attached to the HQs that do some small repairs, but then there are these several dedicated units that you actually have control of as a player. So you can move them in, and as you're moving them, you're basically telling them where to go, and as they go, you're repairing the rail lines. So you actually have to think about that a bit of exactly... You never have enough to repair all the rail lines, so you kind of have to decide which ones are the most important, which way you're going to focus your supplies and the rail line. And I think in this case, um, we're going to head here through Kaunas, so I'm going to start heading in that direction. Where again, normally I would push that guy a little further back. But in this case I didn't, so I'm only going to be able to repair up to here. Alright, and now let's start trying to close this inner loop before I hit the end turn. So, let's take a division and push them down here. And let's attack south with these guys. Alright, well that was something that was actually a bad move on my part because I actually managed to bounce them out of that pocket. Um, but I'm trying to establish a better cordon on the eastern side of that. Maybe I can pull some of these divisions up on this side as well. Let's attack here again. Maybe a hasty attack there. And push to the northeast on that part of the pocket. I mean, the most important thing here is that we did cut the rail lines, so they can't evacuate by rail. But we did not manage to cut all the rail lines out of Minsk. So they could, in theory, evacuate Minsk if they wanted to. Um, and what I'm going to do otherwise is move some of these guys up in preparation for next turn. I don't actually want to route a lot of guys out of this pocket because I know that I'm going to have them encircled and that they're not going to be get out. And that means that next turn, if I destroy them at that point, then we're going to get mass surrenders. We're not going to get units routing out of the pocket. We're not going to get units that are you know, disintegrating, but where I'm not bagging most of the troops. So the goal here, one of the key goals with the uh, Germans when you're fighting this in 1941 as the Germans, is you really want to bag as many Soviet units as you can. In other words, the men and the equipment. Um, taking ground and objectives is important, but you need to annihilate a very large part of the Soviet army to set yourself up for a good 1942. If you don't succeed in that, if you leave too many of them, uh, you know, able to fight, not surrendered, um, going into 1942, then you're going to pay for it. It's going to make 1942 that much harder for you. I mean, in every step here, when you're involved in a full campaign, in every step here, you're really trying to think many, many turns ahead um, in terms of where you want your units to be, how you want your operations to unfold, where you're focusing your resupply. You also have controls, the Germans, of what's called the HQ buildup. So when you have good supply lines, assuming you have planned enough that you've not outrun your rails, and the trucks, I should say, I should show you up here in the top right, you've got a vehicle pool. Those are basically your available vehicles to move supplies or motorize units temporarily, but to mainly move supplies out past your railheads. So if you lose a lot of those vehicles or you know, you're using them for other purposes like motorizing units, you're going to be less efficient moving supplies out past the railheads and your units can also outrun that supply distance. It acts as a bit of a chain. So uh, you know, from your railhead the trucks are going to bring the supplies to your HQs and the HQs are then going to effectively distribute the supplies to the divisions and support units that are attached to the HQ. 
but if they're all too far from the railhead, then that supply can get very limited, and you can potentially outrun it entirely, and your units can be out of supply simply based on distance. And that can also happen, I should note, because of weather. So you can be within range of your railhead, and then suddenly the weather turns to mud, and or you know, blizzard hits, and all of a sudden supplies aren't getting to you anymore, because they can really no longer get that far uh, in that weather in the time that they have to efficiently resupply you. So I think we've done enough for now, so I'm going to let the end turn happen here and let it unfold. I could attack a little bit more here, but uh, I think at this point we're probably fine. And so let's see what the AI does with what I gave it. Uh, that was not what I would call a perfect turn on my part. Uh, I left some, I definitely made some mistakes, but let's see where we go. So ending this now. What you'll see at the top is the AI is thinking, and it's going through a lot of non-movement you know, and combat calculations that it has to do each turn. So it's just finished the logistics phase. And here we go. So what we see here is an interdiction attack by five of our bombers as the Soviet units are moving. So they're moving within range of our uh, of our Air Force, and they're trying to move out of these pockets, move away from our spearheads, and we are trying to interdict them. Our bombers are dropping bombs on them as they move. And you can see none of these attacks is actually doing a huge amount to these Soviet forces, but what's happening is, as they take these attacks while they move, they're losing a little bit of equipment along the way, they're gaining some fatigue, gaining some disruption, and in some cases they may be losing uh, some additional uh, logistical materials as well. The end result is that it makes it harder for them to move, it makes it harder for them to get out, um, slows them down. And you can take a look here, this neck that I left open here of that pocket north of Brest and Tufts, you can see how all these units are trying to move out of that pocket, and now that neck is becoming pretty full. And meanwhile, the units that were here west of Minsk, they're all trying to move towards that other little gap. Now each of these hexes is 10 miles wide, so you can see southwest of Minsk here, there's this one 10-mile gap held by these two Soviet divisions that I was unable to close. And there's a 20 mile gap just to the northwest of that. But there's effectively a 10 mile gap that the Soviet AI is heading for. And, you know, worst case, it's trying to throw enough units in my way that next turn maybe I won't be able to close that gap. That's probably not going to happen at this point in time, but it's certainly going to try. It's going to, pardon me, try to make it cost me more in terms of time and casualties and, and stuff to slow down my drive further to the east. So it's piling the guys in there to try to hold that neck open. Alright, so now we're going through the axis uh, calculations and logistics, and here we see, you know, this is what my gigantic failure comes down to here, is I didn't fully close this pocket. I didn't cut it here, I didn't cut it here, so none of those troops ended up fully isolated, which means that I have to isolate them all over again, which is really a pretty big mistake on my part that <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed I made. 
Uh, but, you know, you get to see the good together with the bad as far as my own playstyle and abilities. And so we start out with a summary of what we've lost as well. So you can see here, these were the total losses. Um, these are permanent losses um, that we've taken so far uh, in this particular scenario. You can see vehicles lost in combat, lost moving supplies, lost moving units, uh, captured from the enemy, damage to all causes. You can see that at this point in time the Soviets have lost about 100,000 men, 1,800 guns, 800 some odd AFVs, and uh, 359 armored cars and their self-propelled vehicles. And we've lost about 5,000 men, uh, sorry, about 11,000 men, 139 guns, 126 AFVs. So, you know, we've certainly got a good situation there. If I hadn't completely messed up the cutting of the pocket, this would be looking pretty great at this point. But you'll also notice that in terms of the victory points, uh, we've got 83 right now, they've got 91. They've been gaining points for holding Vitebsk, Mogolov, and Shlobin. And in terms of the casualties, while we've gained more from the casualties, until we take those objectives, they're going to keep earning points for that. To make matters worse, because I didn't leave enough of a garrison along my lines of communication there, they pushed a few units through. And this red border here indicates that my spearhead here is actually isolated. So it would not have received great supply. So I'm afraid this is sort of an example of things to avoid <laughs> in, uh, in, in Road to Minsk. Don't do what I did here. Uh, even if you're talking to someone else, make sure that you leave extra units along your lines of communication supply, like I did here in the north, so the Soviets can't cut them off and try to be careful to actually close this loop here. I probably got a little bit too aggressive in trying to reach for Minsk. If I had just aimed down here and closed it here, I could have closed it, and then everybody in this whole area would have been isolated. So we'll try to fix that this turn. We've only got three turns in this scenario. So this is turn two, and we'll see how we do. Uh, those guys are still frozen, so let's go ahead and move them up there and start clearing this out again. So you'll see that as I cleared him off the supply line, they're no longer highlighted in red. So they are at the moment back in supply, but that doesn't change the fact that during my uh, during my logistics phase, the supply lines were not ideal. But it does help them in terms of fighting, the fact that they know that supplies have been restored, the fact that they'll have supplies in the next logistics phase. So it's still a good thing to restore those supply lines as soon as possible. And let's take more of these guys and start moving them to close that pocket. We've got this whole army here, the fourth army, that now at this point, because of the AI's movement, that army needs to be focusing on moving east and holding that side of the pocket. It doesn't need to be moving the area that it was holding, or rather holding the area it was holding earlier, because the Soviets have all abandoned that in their attempt to dig it out. Let's see if we can push these guys back without routing them. That's good. Okay. Again, making sure that my headquarters are in range. And let's take these guys and open up this 10th Panzer Division and open up the supplies to the rest of the 2nd Panzer Group, which has now happened. Alright, so my goal here now is going to be to cast the net a lot wider. Uh, I need to obviously cut all these guys off here west of Minsk, but I need to drive on Mogilev or Vitebsk and or Zlobin this turn. Uh, they've moved more units over to defend all those. I really need to take one of those, if not two of them, if I want to be able to win this scenario. Um, these units in the north that were not isolated and which I resupplied somewhat by air, you can see they've still got 48 move, 46 move, 48. Those are really going to be my driving force. So I think Zlobin, uh, well, Zlobin doesn't seem to have much defending it. So I may drive towards Zlobin and Mogilev. Mogilev has a rifle division defending it in the city, and that rifle division uh, has a defense strength of 10 estimated at this point. Though again, fog of war could be destroying that. Vitebsk is another option. 
He's got a rifle division with a strength of four. What we may do is may do one drive down to Zlobin and another drive up to Vitebsk with these units if we can reach. Well, I see I could reach Vitebsk with four movement remaining with that unit. With five remaining with that. I can reach Mogilev with a similar amount. Getting down to Zlobin is harder there. I could go through that side, but then I'm attacking through river. But if I go through there... Alright, so we're going to try for Zlobin and Vitebsk in this case. So first let's solidify our pocket to the west here. Once we've finished that, then we'll start moving the spearheads. Oops. Let's try that again. Hopefully one thing you can see here is while the game itself has an incredible amount of detail and historical accuracy involved. Playing the game is not an exercise in frustration, it's not a chore. The interface is actually fairly simple. The information you need is actually fairly accessible. Uh, the map is really nice looking. The unit counters are very easily readable. So as far as what you really want in a war game to let you manage your information, uh, to let you manage your forces, um, you're not fighting with the interface for those things. And a lot of the functions like I showed before in the commander's report make it very, very easy for you to actually manage that information, filter it, sort it however you want. Um, but you can also play, you know, just from the map. I usually find that I'm checking some of those subscreens once a turn just to make sure I haven't missed anything, but I spend most of the turn on the map actually moving units and fighting there. Soviets are actually trying to interdict some of our units, so why don't we do a few more aircraft attacks, see if they have, still have some air bases in range. Now, apparently nothing significant. Nothing significant at this time. Uh, so let's take the rest of the 2nd Panzer Group Infantry and start that moving east. Because we're going to need that, again, to keep the flanks covered while the Panzers continue to drive. Take our cavalry unit now. And we'll split them up and have them help prevent any more unpleasant surprises coming from our flank here. That'll also allow us to continue this rail repair. So you also have a mode here which you can turn on to see where your rail is repaired and where it's not. So what you can see here is I just repaired this. It's telling me it's going to be green in a turn. You can see all the red rail hexes are the ones that are not going to be carrying supply for us now. So we need to keep choosing those paths. When I've got this unit selected, you can see the red hexes that it can move on to repair rail. So we're going to keep it moving this way. We want to send this supply up toward Minsk. This is much more crucial, of course, in the main campaign. In these first three turns, you know, you're really just going to be starting to outrun your supply lines on that third turn. Um, during turns one and two, you usually have enough of the supplies that you started the battle with remaining that you can keep driving, more or less. But, um, that's a different story once you get to turn 3 and turn 4 and your panzer units start getting deeper and deeper into the Soviet Union. Alright, so let's take the 10th Panzer Division here. Let's flip them around on this side. And we'll take the Gross Deutschland Motorized Regiment. And we'll have them over here. 
And what I'm looking to do here is I'm looking to take my units that might have a little less movement and use those to hold the flank while my units with more movement um, drive on ahead. And that means that we're going to take this motorized division here, push these guys back. That a little more of a choke point there. Okay, we have 29 move left with them. Try to cut off that part of this uh, group of Soviet units that's pushing through there. All right, that does a, honestly a pretty good job of bisecting them. Then we'll take some of these units and push on. These are a little harder once you get these Soviets in good terrain where they're a bit dug in and you're no longer in that initial surprise turn. But we need to push these guys out of the way. For our forces near Minsk to be able to push through to Zlobin, so let's try again. move up here and try that again here. Okay, that's a, that's a good start. Now we've got this Panzer Division here, which is probably going to need to hold this flank. Split that up again for now. Oops, just to make sure we don't have anybody leaking through. I'll take this motorized division, which has a bit more movement, and we'll send that in here to clear out that last unit on the way to the road to Zlobin. Ooh, that really didn't go well for us. The 29th motorized didn't manage to push that rifle division out of the forests. We're going to keep pushing and see... Well, that, uh, that didn't go well for us. Which means we're... Well, I'm going to send the Gosreich on to Zlobin anyway. And the other units up north, we're going to have to clear that last unit out of the way. So we've actually taken Zlobin there, but we have the same problem we had last time as far as keeping our lines of communication unimpeded. So we'll move a few units around from the north to hopefully help with that. Uh, some of these guys that we left behind here. We're going to have the infantry moving up to take that flank. So yeah, we'll take this motorized division out of that area. And we will recombine them, because we split them up last turn. The HQ out of danger. move them down to here, and break them down again to establish a bit of a flank guard for us. And you can reattach units, I should mention, between headquarters. So just because a division starts with one core or one army doesn't mean that you can't move it around. Same thing with your cores and your armies and so on. You can move everything around really, uh, but it costs you administrative points. Those are the number 30 up here, so that's a measure of sort of really what your administrative priorities are. 
uh, when you're trying to replace a commander, for example, let's say you have a commander that's a really bad commander and you have a good commander waiting in the wings. I mean, uh, let's take this guy, for example, here. His dismissal cost is five administrative points. Well, who can we replace him with? Well, if we take a look, we've actually got some really good commanders waiting in the wings here, but there's a cost to replace that commander based on what the rank and, uh, uh, and you know, seniority of the new commander is, and uh, in some cases, <clears throat> the political rating as well. If you're if you got a commander with a good political rating, replace him with one of the worst one, uh, it can be more costly. So we'll take. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, we'll just take Hans Hube. Now, if you promote uh, generals up to a level beyond which they currently are, there's also a chance that their ratings will change, which we saw there. We got a couple of small rating changes happen because he's operating at a new level of command that we did not necessarily know how good he would be at it yet. Uh, he's still quite good though. 7-7 seven, seven mech and infantry, 8 initiative. That'll be more than sufficient. So, uh, let's see... Going up toward Vitebsk. Interdicted. See what that means. Interdicted twice. Will we have enough left to attack? We do. We're going to send this Panzer Division up there as well. <laughs> Guys, I'm actually going to wrap this up shortly. I'm just going to see if I can take these objectives here. All right, so we've got we've gotten two Vitebsk, and this last unit actually has the movement to drive in and actually occupy the city. Now we've got to once again secure our lines there. So we'll try to use this motorized division four. get our HQ moving up there so that it can distribute supplies next turn. Yes, the little black dots are small towns and uh, if you hover over them, and the lines are rail lines, and so if you hover over them you get the name of the town. So for instance this is Orsha here. You can see Smolensk just off the map and Vitebsk up here. Uh, only the larger centers of population actually have map names to keep it a little less cluttered, though there is a map mod if you prefer to always see the names for every settlement, you can absolutely do that uh, just by applying one of those mods. Okay, I don't think my infantry will reach quite far enough, so I'm going to break down this Panzer Division, and that will be my last uh, security force here. So we're going to plop that down right there. Push that out a little further to give us a little bit more spacing. All right. Now let's move the infantry forward and we can yeah, return. They could actually get pretty far. 
We'll have them take up that position there on the hill. And the position in front of Minsk. We're just trying to keep those Soviets bottled up as well as we can. want them breaking out to the east, we also don't want them breaking out to the north. So I'm moving these divisions in to try to make sure that does not happen. In this case I also am going to want some units on the north side of this. Oops. So we'll split that up, move a regiment up to Vilnius, move another regiment up to here. the 2nd Panzer Group Headquarters some protection. Alright, so I think that's it for the 2nd Panzer Group. Now the Soviets snuck in in the meantime and retook Kaunas, so let's push them out. Great, that knocked them right back into that pocket. So as you can see as we go, we're really making our northern flank very secure now. And just again moving up our HQs. And we'll move these guys down. Uh, to make sure that under no circumstances can these Soviets get out. I'm trying to move them so that I don't actually displace these uh, Soviet HQs anymore, the non-combat troops. I'm happy with them being in the pocket, so we'll just keep them from getting out. And over here, we only have a few guys left to move, and then we're done with the turn. Now I should note also, I've kept it on so that it animates the movement for this uh, Let's Play. If you prefer to have your units move instantaneously, you can do that. If you just prefer to have a different delay for either the information that comes up, or uh, you know how long it waits before it moves on. You can set all of that. Um, if we look, oops, wrong one. If we look here. You can see that we've got it adjustable. So for example, I can set the movement animation speed. Well, let's set it to like 0.1, for example. Um, and once we do that, we'll see these units moving a fair amount faster. and you can set it down to zero and then they just jump to their final location and you're not really watching them. So if you know speed of play is important to you and you don't want to so much get the feeling of them moving across the map, then no problem setting it up that way. I think I've done enough here. Um, anybody see anything that I've missed? I hope not. 
Um, we obviously didn't get down to Zlobin with a strong force because we had to push harder on Vitebsk. So I'm sure Zlobin will get cut off, but hopefully we can restore that next turn. Well, I guess one thing we could do is try to fly in some supplies and see if we are in range. Sure, so let's fly to them as they're getting pretty low on it. And maybe to these guys too, since they were the ones who were also isolated last turn due to my uh, poor flank security. And that seems to be it for our fuel drops. So let's go ahead and end the turn again. And now we're going to get into the last, the very last turn of the scenario, turn three. Hi guys, there are actually several map mods. I'm looking at the chat now. Um, there's on the Matrix forums, there's a scenario and modding subforum for War in the East. And there's a pinned post on the top of that, I believe, that lists the various map mods. Um, if not, a quick post anywhere on that forum will also get you a quick link to it. But if you search in that subforum, uh, you know, under map or map mod, I'm sure the others will come up. Uh, there are some that look exactly like this map. They just have place names added. There are others in different styles. Uh, the one made by the user Jison, uh, Jison, Jison, something like that, um, is outstanding. Um, it's but it's a very different map style though. So it, some people may love it, some people may not. Um, but that has all kinds of uh, names as well as a more sort of saturated color style to the map. Um, I know a lot of people play with that. There are also ones that add on some information on, for example, the manpower and resources in the cities to help guide you when you're playing sort of what your most important objectives to either take or protect are in terms of not losing too much of your industry or your resources or your oil and so forth. So there are all kinds of options like that uh, in terms of map mods. All right, so here we go again. It gives us our loss summary, and we can take another look at the victory conditions. So right now, because we stopped them getting more points for Vitebs or Zlobin, they're still getting points for Mogolov. Um, but uh, you know, right now they're up to 127 against our 95, because we're only going to get these points at the end of the game, uh, and everything else is lost points. But what I'm hoping. There we go. Look at all those beautiful red-bordered Soviet units. So we've got one, our division there on Zlobin, that the AI managed to cut off again. But our uh, advance to Vitebsk held. They weren't able to cut that. Looks like they tried with this airborne brigade. And the units that were west of Minsk were not able to break out.